Um, good evening, um, everyone, and um, thank you for us for this um, special lecture by uh, Stephen King. Uh, the Wincott lecture tends to be the highlight of uh, the foundation's um, calendar, and I'm very pleased that we're hosting it at the FT. Uh, we have a lot in common with the Wincott Foundation. Uh, ha Harold, uh, of course, was, uh, as the wisest economic minds uh, often are, a columnist for the FT. Uh, the Foundation, of course, does uh, great work to promote accurate, reliable uh, uh, reporting um, on business and, economic, um, and economics, and that is what we at the FT are about. We also uh, often seem to share leadership because the last uh, two editors and perhaps more uh, of the FT have been uh, chair uh, of, have chaired the foundation. Um, with that, I am going to leave you uh, in the hands of my ex-boss, Lionel Barker, uh, Barker, <laughs> Alex Barker, Lionel Barber. We do have an Alex Barker at the FT uh, who will introduce uh, Stephen. Uh, thank you, Brula, and thank you very much, the FT, for uh, allowing us to come here so Stephen can deliver his, his lecture. We really appreciate that. I only have uh, three news items. Um, the, the first is to say that the Wincott Foundation's awards will shortly be open for entry, and these awards cover um, reporting, personal finance journalism, young journalist of the year, uh, data journalism, uh, uh, an innovation uh, which we introduced a couple of years ago. And many of those journalists who've won or even entered have gone on to great things. So please pass the word. Um, the second is to say um, we have a very distinguished speaker here, Stephen King. Um, former top economist, still advisor to HSBC, uh, author of a number of books. I think it's four. Good. Um, but the third news item is that I first met Stephen um, 10 years ago at the Russian embassy, where he had been invited, along with me and six other guests, to meet Vladimir Putin. And while I was there in my capacity, uh, at the FT, Stephen was in his capacity as the author of a book, the <clears throat> When the Money Runs Out, The End of Western Affluence. Um, naturally, the Russians were delighted to have Stephen <laughs> as, as speaker. Um, and I, uh, he may refer to what happened that evening. I won't other than to say, I immensely enjoyed um, Stephen's contribution to the discussion. And I was immensely envious as Mr. Putin just spent the first 20 minutes ignoring everybody around the table except Stephen. Um, and you'll soon find out why. So here we are, Stephen King on The Return of the Beast. Well, thank you very much, Lionel, and uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the, the good news is that neither Lionel nor myself were poisoned um, that evening. Um, you can't be too careful when you're on Russian sovereign territory. Um, I I'm so delighted to be here um, tonight. I have to say that I'm slightly intimidated by the quality um, of the audience. Um, I should tell you that the Wincott Foundation, according to their website, uh, seeks to contribute to the better understanding of economic issues. Uh, and Bill Robinson invited me to come along. I'm not sure. Uh, that perhaps his optimism might be misplaced to certain. I'll do my best this evening to see uh, uh, what I can say, but um, I make my own modest contribution. But I would say that given the illustrious group of speakers uh, who've been with the Wincott Foundation over many, many years, I do feel very much that I'm standing on the very broad shoulders of an awful lot of the giants. And I have a certain degree of imposter syndrome, but I'll try to do my best to uh, say something useful uh, this evening. And I'm delighted, of course, to be here and to talk about inflation and the return of the beast. Um, now, to be fair, um, some people might ask now, 
Well, shouldn't it be a different question, which is, has the inflationary beast been slain? Uh, because we've seen some pretty dramatic developments in financial markets over the course of the last few weeks, uh, pointing to the idea that interest rates will definitely be going down, possibly in the first half of next year. And all the problems of inflation have basically gone away. That, I think, however, uh, would be premature. And part of the reason why I think it's premature is that the big reduction in headline inflation owes a lot to what's happened to energy prices and food prices around the world. If you focus on core inflation, you get a rather different picture, um, not just in terms of how bad the inflationary impulse was in the first place, but also in terms of the progress that's been made in reducing um, in inflation. So with core inflation, it didn't peak at anything like the kind of rate that we saw with headline inflation. I think we all know that. But just to give you some figures, um, core inflation in the US, it peaked at around about 5.5%. Is now down to 3.7%. In the Eurozone, core inflation peaked a little over 5.5%, and it's now down to 4.2%. And in the UK, um, it uh, peaked at 7.1%, and is now down to 5.7%. It's very lucky that the government didn't target core inflation um, for its uh, interim goal at the end of this year. So we have made some progress, but I want to put this in the context of where inflation was uh, before the onset of the COVID pandemic. It's just useful to sort of remind ourselves of where inflation was previously. So before the pandemic, US and UK core inflation uh, were both consistently below 2%, not a huge amount below 2%, but below 2%. And Eurozone core inflation was consistently below 1%. So even though core inflation has come down from its peaks, it's still well above where it was pre-pandemic. And it's also worth noting that pre-pandemic, the sort of discussion that everyone had at the time was about the threat of deflation um, rather than inflation. We were all convinced about a kind of Japanification um, of the world economy. And if 2% targets couldn't be met back then, it was because inflation was undershooting those targets rather than overshooting those targets. Whereas now we are consistently talking about a sense of inflation being stickily high and persistently being above those previous targets. So my plan tonight is as follows. I'm going to offer you, first of all, three denials. Um, secondly, four tests. And I'm going to finish with hopefully a Hollywood ending. So there's something to look forward to um, at the end of my talk. Um, so denials, first of all. I would suggest that my profession has been mostly in denial about the return of inflation. And there are two aspects to this denial. The first aspect comes earlier. Earlier in the sense that people back in 2020 or 2021 were effectively saying it couldn't possibly happen, that we were living in a deflationary world and there's just no way that inflation could return. And more recently, the denial is effectively saying, yes, inflation did return, but it's gonna disappear as quickly as it had arrived. There's no sense, I would suggest, amongst the consensus that inflation could return and stay there for a longer period of time. So what's fueled this denial? Well, the first is pretty obvious, that there was a massively deflationary mindset uh, before the onset of the COVID pandemic. And even during the early stages of the COVID pandemic, uh, there was a sense that the pandemic itself was deflationary rather than inflationary. I want to offer you three quotes uh, from policymakers uh, that all came through in 2020 and 2021 to capture uh, this deflationary bias. The first one says, a reduction in office use could weigh persistently on demand for rental spaces and rents, which may feed through into lower cost inflation and a period of weaker price inflation. The second one, um, when considering risks of persistent above target inflation before we have recovered most of the lost ground, my attitude is I will believe it if and when I see it. And the third one, and you'll all know where this comes from, the third one says current high inflation readings are likely to prove transitory. Now, the course was from Jerome Powell in August of 2021. Now, it is worth stressing here that I looked uh, today, actually, at uh, where core inflation was 
back in August 2021. It was described as being high, but actually core inflation in August 2021 was lower than it is today. So for all the progress that's been made over the last few months, inflation is still higher than the transitory high inflation uh, that Powell was referring to back in August of 2021. So it seems to me that there's a mindset that said it was impossible for inflation to return. Um, and even when the evidence began to build, particularly through 2021, most of the evidence was, was ignored. Um, so the evidence starts with upside surprises to inflation in the US and then a little later on in the Eurozone of the UK. Admittedly, first of all, the inflation is really a story about semiconductor prices and prices of secondhand cars. But later that year, you're seeing more in the way of, of goods prices rising, far fewer goods prices falling, which has been a big feature of the sort of deflationary period earlier on. And then services inflation accelerating, and then wages beginning to respond. So by the end of 2021, you had a very different kind of story emerging from what had been true at the beginning. The second uh, denial is associated with a focus on headline inflation alone, um, which of course went up by more than core inflation, has also come down by more than core inflation. Um, Paul Krugman the other week declared that the war on inflation is over. Um, but is it? Uh, because if it really were over, why is it that short-term interest rates are still so much higher than anyone had predicted two or three years ago? Why is it that central banks are warning us about higher for longer? In fact, why was Andrew Bailey referring to that just today? Um, it turns out, I think, that the monetary costs of keeping inflation under control are far higher than people had expected. The levels of interest rates are far higher than people had expected. And no one today is advocating return to the kind of zero interest rate world that we had pre-pandemic. So even if you think that inflation is a bit better under control than had been the case, the monetary costs of bringing it under control have been much bigger than people had thought. And this reminds me a little bit of my experience at the Treasury on the eve of the Lawson boom. Um, where's Terry? And Terry's in the audience. Oh, there he is. Um, so you'll remember this. Uh, so um, on the eve of the Lawson boom, there were two narratives that began to emerge in the Treasury. The first one, was a narrative associated with a fall in headline inflation, which itself was associated with the collapse in oil prices in the middle of the 1980s. And the second one was a narrative that was focusing on wage growth, which was still very elevated. And to give you some rough and ready numbers, uh, inflation came down about 3.5% in about 1987 or 88, which was very low by the standards of the time. Wage growth uh, was running about 7.5%. And half the economists thought that uh, the fall in headline inflation would effectively enable inflation expectations themselves to come down and everything would be absolutely fine and dandy. And the other half thought that this persistent wage pressure uh, would be a far bigger long-term problem. And as it turned out, it was the wage pressure that was the bigger long-term problem because it was the Lawson boom uh, ended in some tears. And then the final denial is what I described as a confusion between uh, global shocks and the influence of local policies. Because if you think of inflation as being purely driven by global shock, purely by, I don't know, increases in gas prices or oil prices or food prices, whatever it might be, you might think that the consequences would be similar for inflation in lots of different parts of the world. But they haven't been. Uh, I'll give you three examples. The first example is China, where inflation has been remarkably well behaved. Um, over the course of the last few years. In fact, if anything, they still got a deflationary uh, challenge rather than inflationary challenge. At the opposite extreme, you've got the usual suspects like Argentina um, and Turkey. And then for the rest of us, it's probably fair to say that our inflationary experience has been more uh, than we had bargained for. What I want to suggest is that it's not just the shock that matters, but it's also what you do about that shock when it comes along. And this takes me back to the 1970s. Um, everyone knows the story about the 1970s, about the 1970s inflation. It's caused by the quadrupling of oil prices in 1973, which is regarded as the cause of the inflationary difficulties of the 1970s, except that's completely wrong uh, because inflation was rising rapidly, particularly in the US and also in the UK in the years preceding 1973. And I would describe the 
oil shock in 1973 is really the icing on an already existing inflationary cake. I also want to make the point that when it came to the oil shock itself, different countries subsequently had very different experiences in terms of inflationary outcomes. Germany, uh, a really successful story with regard to inflation, its inflationary averaged in the five years of 1978 um, about exactly the same as it averaged in the five years of 1973. There's no hint of an underlying change in inflationary behavior, even though there was a quadrupling of oil prices. For the record, it's 4.5% um, in both periods. British inflation was already averaging 7.5% before um, the oil shock, and then averaged 16.1% in the five years after um, the oil shock. So same shock but very different outcomes. And I would suggest that one of the big differences in terms of outcomes was that the Germans took the inflation shock seriously and said, we have to do something about it in terms of, in terms of keeping monetary policy tight or tighter than it would otherwise have been. And the narrative in Britain uh, was to suggest that the inflation was caused by external events. I think you could do about that. The important thing in terms of British policy was to support the labor market, keep unemployment low uh, and boost economic growth. And one of those approaches worked and the other approach didn't work. Um, in fact, this um, reminds me, or encourages me to uh, give you a quote. Uh, to a considerable extent, inflation has been the consequence of costs and prices imported from abroad and over which we have no control. And I've asked people who said that, and people said Andrew Bailey or Christine Lagarde or, uh, or maybe Jerome Powell, but actually it's Anthony Barber um, who was the Chancellor of the Exchequer um, in February 1974, actually so just before they were booted out of office. But nevertheless, it's a very good example of blaming everybody else for a, an inflationary difficulty that might have required some kind of additional domestic changes. And this is relevant for today and relevant for my comparison between China um, and the West. Because in, nine, in, in sorry, 1920, in 2020, I'm going back far too far, in 2020, um, China did not have the same COVID lockdown problems that the West had. Uh, lockdowns in China were infrequent, they were modest, and the economy did not collapse in the way that Western economies collapsed. As a consequence of that, Chinese policy uh, was not loosened at anything like the pace that we saw in the UK or the Eurozone or in the US. And I would suggest also that the Chinese were cautious about loosening policy anyway because of their experience in terms of property boom um, after the global financial crisis. So effectively, the Chinese policy was rather similar to the German policy uh, back in the 1970s. Cautious, conservative, not willing to do too much. The West looked at the economic collapse taking place in 2020 and said, this is just like the Great Depression. Um, and the Great Depression, one thing you do in that period is you loosen fiscal and monetary policy as far as you possibly can. Because if you do that, um, you might end up preventing the Great Depression from getting any worse. The problem with this is that um, the Great Depression was associated with mass bankruptcies, um, with uh, mass unemployment, uh, with massive bank failures, and with a huge collapse in asset prices. And this time around, none of that happened. Uh, in fact, I would argue that fiscal policy was very, very useful in taking the pressure off balance sheets of households and corporates putting it onto the balance sheet of the government or future taxpayers. And therefore, the monetary stimulus was perhaps to a degree unnecessary uh, because what were you stimulating? You had lockdowns. You couldn't actually get people to spend. All that happens, in fact, is that the monetary stimulus pushes up asset prices dramatically, makes people financially wealthier, even though they can't currently spend. But when they are able to spend, when lockdowns come to an end, they spend with some degree of enthusiasm, which is hardly surprising. But as lockdowns come to an end, there's a marked reluctance on behalf of policymakers themselves to reverse that earlier monetary stimulus. So you have a lot of pent up demand um, and not much control of that demand and when lockdowns come to an end. So it seems to me that making comparison between China and the West does reveal something about the importance of domestic policy in exaggerating the extent to which inflation uh, was itself uh, rising. So I'm now going to move on from denial uh, to what I describe as reality. Uh, inflation, I think, is back in one way or another. It's proving costly to defeat, and it's not obvious as yet, but it has been defeated. Um, so what's gone wrong? I'm going to offer four tests, four tests for why things might have gone wrong. Um, and the first of these is, has there been 
what I describe as inflation threatening institutional change. And I'm going to refer to two factors that I think have been important in recent years. The first one comes out in August 2020. It's the Federal Reserve's adoption of a flexible average inflation target. Now, the Fed did this with good reason. They had a long period of inflation undershooting target. There was a fear that deflation had taken hold in a serious way. Um, and effectively, it was a commitment to being irresponsible with regard to inflation. The idea would be that if you undershot an inflation in the past, you would deliberately overshoot and encourage people to believe you were overshooting um, in the future, because that way you could effectively lower real interest rates, you could reduce real debt levels, and you can encourage people to spend more. And if they spend more, then deflation itself goes away. So it's a great idea. But it also meant, though, that if you had inflation rising for other reasons, your commitment to the flexible average inflation targeting regime meant that you couldn't really respond. You couldn't raise rates quickly enough because it turned out that you'd made that commitment not to raise interest rates because you were determined to deal with deflation. So if you have a sort of a, a flipping over of risks from in deflation to inflation, you're initially paralyzed. You can't do what you should be doing to deal with the inflationary threat. And the second institutional change relates to QE, quantitative easing. Now, a lot of people have said that QE is all about printing money and it's a disaster, it's going to create lots of inflation. And I don't have a great deal of sympathy with that, I think, a simplistic view. But what I would say is that QE has distorted bond markets. It's a sort of mechanism in one sense to nationalize government bond markets. And the reason why that's important is that um, if you're nationalizing bond markets, they can no longer provide the signals that might tell you in advance that you have an inflationary problem or a fiscal problem. Cast your minds back to you know, long before QE, you had the bond market vigilantes who were always at work trying to spot the first weakness of the country in terms of inflation or fiscal policy. The bond yields would rise. The rise in bond yields would tell the policymakers they had to act to remain credible. And under those circumstances, eventually policymakers learned to do what they should be doing. But if you do QE and you persist with it and you nationalize your bond market, you don't have the same kind of effect. And what's interesting is that through the course of 2021 and probably early 2022, bond yields remain very, very low, even as inflation was rising. And worse, because bond yields remain very, very low, thanks to QE, central banks were able to say, look, the bond market isn't fearful of inflation. That means that inflation expectations are under control. We've got nothing to worry about. It was precisely their own policy of nationalizing bond markets that blinded them uh, to the extent to which inflation um, was pick, picking up. The second test is money. Uh, now, there are some monetarists in the room, but I'm not a, uh, an out and out monetarist, but I do think that money should be taken more seriously than it has been done in recent years. Um, and the reason for saying this is partly because in 2020, and going back to this idea of tremendous stimulus, money supply growth, went completely off the chart, particularly in the US and to a lesser degree in the UK and the Eurozone. And I think it's very difficult to find much in the way of central bank comment at the time, suggesting this might be a potential problem. I'd also note that although money supply in some cases has turned negative recently, it's worth stressing that the, the actual stock of money relative to the size of the nominal economy in the US, UK, Eurozone is still unusually high, which might well mean that there's still a lot of pent-up spending still to come through. So I would suggest that to the extent that money had accelerated, um, it was something that should have raised a red flag and didn't. It was broadly ignored. Um, and by being ignored, it meant that there were pieces of information that central banks chose to ignore that I think in hindsight would have been wise to have looked at and to consider and to sort of regard as being a potential threat. Um, I think that was a significant failure, which has contributed uh, to the extent to which inflation has risen. The third test is, are you so confident in your credibility uh, as a central banker that you effectively trivialize inflationary evidence until it's far too late? Now, I think this is partly a fault of the inflation targeting framework, frankly. Most central banks will tell you that policy works with a lag of between one and a half and two years. And because they can't admit that their policies today are wrong, it effectively means that their forecast for inflation two years ahead is remarkably almost always at 2%. In fact, if you look at the Bank of England's forecast over the course of the last few years, 
they're always at 2% or slightly below 2%, but nothing other than uh, those numbers, which, given what's happened, I think is rather remarkable. And I think one of the problems here is that we've moved towards a sort of Lars Svensson approach, a forecast targeting rule, whereby the central bank sits down and says, we've got a model that predicted inflation pretty well over the course of the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, what's the new information this month compared with last month? Uh, does that mean we have to rethink our our forecast of inflation will maybe a little bit here or there. If we have to rethink them, we'll nudge rates up or down a little bit. But that approach doesn't really allow you to consider there's actually a structural change in the inflationary performance of the economy. It doesn't help you to think about a world whereby you go from inflation being low to a world where inflation is persistently high, because you effectively assume away that possibility in your forecast targeting approach. In other words, if you say that you're a credible central bank, and the public recognize that you have an inflation target and they recognize your credibility, then you will always forecast 2% in two years' time. But a moment's thought reveals the problem with this, which is that if the public see year after year after year that you're either overshooting or undershooting your inflation target persistently in one direction, the public will begin to think you don't know what you're doing. And at that point, your credibility uh, is rather destroyed. So it's great assuming you've got the credibility, but you also have to earn it. And you earn it in the difficult times rather than the easy times. And in my view, if you assume that all times are easy, you never actually get round to earning the credibility you should be looking for. And my final test is, is are there any supply side shocks? In, in my view, there is far too much emphasis on output gaps driven by changes in demand relative to a given level of supply. And I think we need to think much more about how supply itself changes. In just a moment's thought about productivity growth over the course of the last 50, 60 years, and how it's varied from very high numbers for a period of time to now very low numbers would tell you quite a lot about the ways in which supply potential can change, which in turn has a direct consequence for, for monetary policy itself. And I'd like to also suggest that central banks during the good times when inflation was, if anything, too low rather than too high, were very quick to take um, the credit uh, for this persistence of very low inflation. Um, the great moderation, as it was first described, was hijacked by central bankers themselves, effectively to say, look, it is our monetary credibility, our monetary framework that's given rise to these lower and lower inflation rates for any given growth rate um, of the economy. The problem with that is that the original authors of the paper on the Great Moderation didn't argue that at all. Uh, they argued the Great Moderation was partly associated with the effects of globalization, particularly hyper-globalization, uh, the fact that for the West, uh, more and more resources were being produced, or more goods particularly, were being produced in low-cost areas of the world. The West effectively was importing a lot of deflation from elsewhere, and that helped to bring inflation down for any given Western growth rate which was lovely while it lasted, it created a kind of positive deflationary tailwind. But the risk was always that that might go into reverse. And I'd like to suggest that that reverse was happening actually long before COVID. Um, the deteriorating relationship between Beijing and Washington is an obvious thing to talk about. You might, in certain circles, mention Brexit as a, being a factor that indicated a sort of partial reversal. Um, of globalization. You can think about the rise of protectionism, populism, isolationism, nationalism as all good examples of where the pace at which integration has continued to advance has slowed uh, really quite dramatically. Um, and you end up with the idea, I think, that we lived through a long period where there was a deflationary tailwind, but we now have an inflationary headwind, which in one sense has been magnified through the effects of COVID um, and the urgency of trying to shorten global supply chains, going for nearshoring, reshoring, uh, onshoring, friendshoring, uh, all these kinds of phrases that have emerged, which in one sense are an indication that we're not quite so confident um, in the continuation of what are basically fragile global supply chains. And we want insurance against that fragility, but that insurance comes at a price. And in fact, what you're talking about is the idea that that any given growth rate in the global economy, you're likely to end up with a higher inflation rate, or turn it upside down for any given inflation rate, you may have to accept a lower growth rate than you had previously. I promised you a Hollywood ending, and we're now advancing to that final part of my talk. Um, 
My Hollywood ending refers to Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor. Uh, for younger members of the audience, you could probably think about Ben Affleck and Jay Lowe. Um, but anyway, um, why are they relevant? We might think they're not relevant at all, but the reason why they're relevant is that the relationship between Burton and Taylor was on, it was off, it was on, it was off. You never quite knew quite what was going on. But I did discover when I was researching uh, my, my book, uh, this, um, this excellent book here, uh, uh, we talk about inflation, um, uh, that, um, that when Burton died, just before he died, he wrote a final love letter to Elizabeth Taylor. Um, and the story goes that when she died, she took that love letter to her grave. So even though you thought the relationship was off, it was still kind of on. This is a beautiful romance about this story. But anyway, the reason why it's relevant is that Burton and Taylor are the equivalent of monetary and fiscal policy. Uh, that monetary and fiscal policy, sometimes they're related, sometimes they're separate. And we've actually gone through a long period of thinking that they're completely separate because we have independent central banks um, and we have uh, governments that, uh, in some cases, take their fiscal commitments reasonably seriously, although well, I would suggest that many of them have been a little bit less serious um, in recent years. But the long history of inflation is really about the times when that Burton-Taylor relationship is rekindled. Um, it's the idea that monetary and fiscal policy eventually come back together again because it's just impossible to keep them separate when you're faced with political choices that make it very difficult to deliver the kinds of outcomes you want to deliver without cheating uh, with the printing press. So some examples, the Roman Empire between around about the beginning of the Common Era and 300 in the Common Era, um, a lot of inflation. Why? Well, effectively because uh, the silver content of denarii was massively watered down. There was an awful lot of um, uh, monetary destruction, effectively. And the reason for that was that the Roman Empire couldn't really afford to employ all the soldiers having to employ to try to ward off the attacks on all fronts. So the way they did it, effectively, was to cheat uh, by printing more and more money, effectively, uh, or debasing the coinage. Uh, and the consequence was that the price level rose considerably over a 300-year period. I should stress, by the way, that it was ended temporarily by Diocletian in 301 AD, or CE, um, with his edict on maximum prices. It was a very early example of price controls. And just for those of you who don't know, it didn't work. Um, second example is during the French Revolution. Um, in the early stages of the French Revolution, what was seen as money disappeared from France extremely quickly. Did anyone who get their gold or silver out got it out. And yet the revolutionary authorities were very keen uh, still to deal with their debt obligations. And they didn't want to be seen to be defaulting. So what they had to do was to create new money. And they created these things called assignats. Um, I'm afraid to say that in the process of creating them, they also created a huge amount of inflation. So again, there's a connection between the fiscal side and the monetary side. And the third example is actually in the aftermath of the American Civil War, because there was a kind of 19th century version of a debate that should be familiar to anyone who's looking at the Eurozone today. Because after the American Civil War, you had, in a very simple sense, creditors of the victorious uh, Union states, and you had debtors from the defeated Confederate states, and they, funnily enough, wanted to have different monetary regimes. Um, the Unionists wanted to have a gold standard, which was you know, Bundesbank style, tough money, very good if you're a creditor. Um, and the Confederates um, wanted to have a silver standard, uh, which basically meant they'd have a lot more inflation, which of course is very good news if you happen to be a debtor. And I mention this because in the Eurozone today, you have a significantly higher inflation rate than we've had for quite some time. I'm thinking, well, which countries would like that and which countries wouldn't like it? And I can tell you that Italy, looking at the impact of this on its uh, fiscal sustainability, this is, this is great news. I mean, higher inflation in Italy is very good news. If you're German, you might have some doubts about um, the revival of inflation. In other words, if you're a creditor, uh, you might be not so happy with what's been happening. Anyway, the point about all this is that there is a connection that comes back from time to time between monetary and fiscal policy. It's unavoidable. It's been there throughout history. And there are two things I want to observe about the current situation. The first of these is that the increase in government debt um, in the developed world 
over the last 10, 15 years, since really the onset of the global financial crisis, has been the biggest we've seen in the entirety of peacetime. The only other occasion we've seen government debt rising as much as it has done recently is during wartime. And there are lots of bad things about wars, but the one good thing about wars is they tend to come to an end. And when they come to an end, you can sort of deal with some of your debts because you stop spending on military things you were spending on previously, and hopefully your domestic economy will begin to flourish to a greater degree. So we've already had these huge increases in indebtedness. But the projections for the future uh, from the Congressional Budget Office or from the OBR here um, are frankly truly terrifying. Um, so I'll give you the numbers. Uh, on current policies in the US, largely because of population aging, the impact on uh, health care, social care, uh, you end up with US government debt rising to 181% of GDP by 2053. And in the UK, on the OBR's projections, government debt rises to, I still can't quite believe I'm reading this out, but to 310% uh, by 2073. I mean, these are remarkable numbers. Um, and when you think about those numbers, you think, well, how do you live um, with levels of government debt uh, up there uh, when you have political pressure not to act in the usual traditional way with regard to fiscal policy. In the UK, for example, I mean, I know that perhaps we'll have a tax cut tomorrow, but, but generally speaking, there's not much room for tax cuts. And there's certainly uh, no room to raise taxes significantly because the tax burden already is very high. On the spending side, I've already mentioned the demographic pressures that are there, but there are additional pressures coming through on defense because the world has changed. Um, on, on climate change in terms of the energy transition, um, all these things are going to matter in the future, add more to spending. It's very difficult to bring in other parts of spending to cope with these additions. So if you can't raise taxes very easily, and you can't cut spending, and you haven't got a magic wand to generate much faster productivity, well, maybe we have with AI, who knows? But at the moment, there's not much sign of a magic wand coming through to generate additional productivity. What are you left with um, in terms of this story? Well, you can default. Um, emerging markets in the past have done, but it tends to end in tears because your creditors begin to realize that you're not very trustworthy. You can deliver financial repression, and I think we'll see quite a lot of that. I mean, everyone knows about Regulation Q in the US, which operated from the 1930s through to the 1970s, effectively banning banks from uh, offering interest on deposits and therefore made it very easy for uh, the Treasury Department to, to raise funds cheaper than would otherwise have been the case. And it may be that today, uh, governments will say that banks aren't safe enough and therefore they should be holding more in the way of extremely safe government debt because uh, that will help in terms of their, their capital risks, which is a neat ar argument. But of course, if government debt itself is huge, it may be more problematic. Um, if you borrowed in your own currency, the US, uh, the most obvious example, you can devalue because your devaluation will impose a burden on your foreign creditors rather than on yourself, at least directly, or you may end up with higher interest rates as a consequence of it. But the most obvious thing to do through history is just create some inflation. Because inflation, and I think this is something that's forgotten about inflation, is inflation is not a, it's not a sort of technocratic process, uh, which simply means that all prices and wages and everything rise at the steady state all the way through the time. It's a hugely redistributional process. It creates winners and losers. And although people often focus on the income distribution effects of, of higher inflation, I think the bigger thing to focus on here is really the relationship between creditors and debtors. Because inflation, there's no doubt about it, so long as it's not anticipated and not fully reflected in changes in interest rates, the risk with inflation is it effectively benefits debtors at the expense of creditors. And if it happens to be that your biggest debtor in your economy is the government, the government's going to begin to say, actually, we could do with a bit of inflation to help us out because all the other choices are really, really horrible. Um, and in those circumstances, I think that the era of um, independent central banks is only an era because it reflects the wishes of society at any particular point in time. But there is no guarantee that that era of independence will be maintained into the future for the very simple reason that if I'm right about Burton and Taylor, that relationship between monetary and fiscal policy will inevitably return, particularly in current circumstances where the debt position of government seems to be so unbelievably bad. So history suggests that the time will come when the printing presses 
have to be turned back on because the other political options are unworkable or unfeasible. And to give you the Hollywood ending, Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton will rise from the dead, proving that inflation is not just part of the past and not just part of the present, but just possibly also part of the future too. Thank you very much. Um, Stephen will take some questions from the distinguished audience among whom are many economists. Thank you for a, a brilliant lecture, I must say, and I hadn't thought of um, Richard Burton, Elizabeth Taylor. Burton and Taylor. <laughs> I, was, I think you're talking, to use a Hollywood phrase, conscious recoupling between, <laughs> between monetary and fiscal policy. So anyway, uh, who would like to ask the question? Yes, ma'am. Do you, do you want to just say who you are? I know who you are, Vicky. It's Vicky. <laughs> yes, uh, Vicky Price. Um, that was a great lecture. Um, I just want to ask the um, what's going on in, in Europe. You mentioned it, and you mentioned that they've had high inflation and so on. But we have a number of countries that are already there in deflation right now, such as the Netherlands, Belgium, admittedly small countries. And even the place I come from originally, which is Greece, um, has had a couple of months in the summer of inflation of just 1.6 percent which is quite extraordinary now of course on the other hand you mentioned some of those very high debt to gdp ratios again coming from greece that didn't seem particularly frightening if i may say so because we've been there ourselves um you had a crisis but, though didn't you I mean, yeah we had a crisis yes but uh, we still have that and we now growing we grew at the fastest rate we grew excuse me greece grew at the fastest rate um of any other country in europe last year which was five percent but the real question is despite everything that you mentioned Despite huge QE in uh, Europe, which has been, you know, similar to what we've seen, in, and a lot of fiscal support, they have seen a very substantial decline in the rate of inflation, much faster than almost anybody else, except of course China. Um, and um, they are um, back to target. So, what do you? How do you explain that by comparison to where we are here? Uh, first of all, I, I haven't looked at the detail of every single member of the Eurozone to explain their individual inflation numbers. And I think one reason why I haven't done that, apart from inherent laziness, uh, is the fact that you wouldn't look at Cornwall versus uh, Lancashire versus Scotland in terms of trying to work out what's going on with UK inflation. You would look at the overall number and accept that there'll be differences across different countries. The second thing I'd note is that um, in some cases it does relate directly to fiscal policies that we use one way or another to deal with the energy crisis. So in some cases you may have exchanged a much lower current inflation rate uh, for a significantly larger budget deficit than would otherwise be the case. Now if the budget deficit is at the country level and the inflation is at the international level, um, then the direct consequence for the country is, is quite small which is another way of saying that you can get away with borrowing more in the short term than might otherwise be the case. The third thing I note is that the ECB did put in a, a, a policy over the last two or three years, basically said that we will decide uh, if a rise in bond yields is justified through fundamentals or not, as the case may be. And if it's not, then we will intervene uh, to prevent that bond yield from rising in any significant way. Now, I'm sure that the people in Frankfurt are experts on bond markets and bond market spreads, but it does worry me that you know, trying to decide in real time whether a widening of spreads is justified or not is terribly difficult. And it comes back to this idea that there's a kind of almost like a nationalization of bond markets because the central bank is in the business of buying bonds because it's saying there's no fundamental reason for the bond yield to rise. So if investors know that, uh, then there's every chance that bond yields won't rise. And therefore, there's no punishment for a country that actually you know, loosens fiscal policy to a significant degree. However, I, I would put it slightly differently. Um, imagine a world, um, we, we wake up tomorrow, um, ECB's been abolished, and the Bundesbank is now in charge, again, of European monetary policy. Um, my question would be, where would interest rates be if the Bundesbank was in charge? And I think the answer is they'd be significantly higher than they are today, and they would have risen much earlier than they did. So it seems to me that there is a material difference between what the ECB has done and what the Bundesbank would have done in similar circumstances. And that, in turn, may explain some of the extent to which inflation uh, 
has been more persistent than might have been expected. So I think there are obviously some differences in terms of individual countries. The Netherlands, for example, you mentioned, had a huge spike in inflation, so the year-on-year -year number would have improved because of that huge spike last year. The numbers were incredibly high uh, last year. Uh, but overall, I would, I would still argue that the inflation outcome for the Eurozone is not as attractive as it could be, if I can put it that way. Yes, sir. I think there's a mic coming your way. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Sumesh, a uh, financial journalist master student at City University of London. And my question is on inflation forecasting and how you said that uh, almost always, and giving an example of Bank, Bank of England, that they, fo they forecast inflation at 2%, one and a half, two years ahead of time. So is there any central bank uh, whose inflation forecasting model is better than the Bank of England or the best? And second, uh, should the central banks in that case start chasing inflation uh, sooner than they do right now, like six months or three months down the line? How, what do you think about that? So in, in this excellent book, there's a table uh, of, of the uh, Bank of England. This is the there's, there's a table in there of the Bank of England's inflation forecast going back over the last three or four years. Um, and what it shows is that the one year ahead forecast tends to move in line with the current spot inflation rate. So if inflation is going up, the one year ahead forecast tends to go up as well. But the two year ahead forecast stays at 2% all the time. This comes back to my point that if you, if you assume as a central bank that you know what you're doing and that your policies are fully credible, um, and that monetary policy works with a lag of a year and a half or two years. What else can you forecast? In other words, it's a, it's a weakness, I think, of the inflation targeting framework. If you do it differently, one way you could do it differently is to say um, that there are a series of events that are taking place that mean that if we were to return inflation to 2% within two years, you know, the consequence of the economy would be too painful, and therefore we'd rather delay it for another year or two. So you could say we're going to the, the sort of you know, the landing path is is slower, smoother, than might otherwise be the case. You could explain it that way and admit that in two years' time, inflation might be higher or lower than might be the case. And the other thing you could do, which actually is in more lesson from the earlier period of deflation rather than the current period of inflation, is to say that there are circumstances where, really beyond your control, inflation is likely to be persistently lower or higher than the target. So in the deflationary period, um, I think it would have been reasonable for central bankers to have said, we're importing all this deflation from elsewhere in the world. It is legitimate in those circumstances to have an actual inflation down at one or a half or zero, or maybe even negative for a period of time. And to cite what happened in the late 19th century during the first period of globalization, um, when countries under the gold standard uh, mostly had falling prices. But they, these were prices that were falling relative to wages. So real wages were rising and no one was really bothered by it. So I, I think there's a, almost a, a fetish dislike of deflation in such a way uh, that when you have this good deflation being imported, uh, you end up loosening domestic policy far too much. You're basically trying to create domestically generated inflation to offset the imported deflation. And then all you end up with is financial bubbles of the kind we saw in the 1990s and, and beyond. So you know, monetary policy isn't just about inflation, it's also about financial stability. And if you're trying to chase an inflation target, which itself is maybe not that relevant, then you're going to end up, I think, with a, a greater degree of financial instability. Yes, Bill. Um, inflation is, uh, by the way, if we, I mean, like everyone else, love the lecture. Um, inflation, is, inflation is often described as a tax, and it is, it is of course, the supply has to be equal demand as we know and if they haven't got the fiscal policy right inflation makes up the difference and i think you pointed out and i very strongly agree what we're looking at are so many things where demand is you know we, we need to put more money into education we need to put more money into health we need to put more money into defense and and yet there's this massive political resistance to the idea that actually in that world it will be very sensible to put up taxes, and surely people must understand that. Do you think people will ever understand that, or will it always have to be the inflation tax? So you go back to another excellent book that uh, Lionel referred to earlier on, which is When the Money Runs Out, the End of Western Affluence. So, so, so here's, here I think is the fundamental issue. It's not necessarily about levels of taxation or spending. It's actually about economic growth. 
uh, it's about productivity growth. Um, so, so politicians are very good at making promises about the future based on the extrapolation of the past. And if you look at the sort of growth rates that and the increases in living standards that say the UK saw in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, even the 1990s, uh, it was plausible to make those kinds of promises and to meet those promises because you knew given the certain growth rate of the economy that at some point in the future your tax revenues would be much much higher just because of the economic growth what i think has been striking about the last 20 25 years perhaps is that underlying growth rates have slowed down dramatically um and i would argue that the reason why we have these big fiscal problems is because you know, governments have assumed that growth would be X, and it's X minus something. So therefore, their tax revenues are persistently lower than they had anticipated. Uh, but of course, they continue to make promises to the public, uh, which the public want to hear. Uh, so you just slowly run out of money. We didn't literally run out of money, but I mean, you, you get that constant fiscal pressure. So mm -hmm. I, I would like there to be, and I don't have the answer to this, but I would like there to be a much bigger debate about what drives productivity, uh, what you can do to improve the supply side performance of economies um, and what you can try to do to, to escape from what is effectively a kind of demographic Japanese type trap. Um, because otherwise you will find that your fiscal numbers continue to deteriorate. And I, I think, Bill, you're absolutely right that if you want to have all this extra public spending, you know, by all means, raise the tax threshold. But tax, threshold, tax level in the UK now, the share of GDP is, I think it's the highest it's been. So you're already at a point when you're asking people to pay taxes at a level that they've never done before. Um, and if you take those OBR projections at face value, that situation is going to get worse rather than better. Um, and there are other things you can do. You can you know, raise retirement age. You can make sure that your older population is healthier and can stay in work for longer. Um, all those things you can do. You can have more in the way of immigration uh, to try to boost the volume of your number of your working population relative to your retired population, you know, these, these are possibilities. Uh, but each of them has, you know, political difficulties associated with them. But I think, you know, productivity is the big missing part of the story. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I definitely detected you channeling your inner trust there. But, but anyway. Um, I, I, that, that would be a mischaracterization, yeah, course, I think, it's yeah. fair to say. Indeed. Uh, <laughs> um, Catherine and then and John, let's take two, because we, we're... we're Fairly tight on time. Catherine. Hi, thanks very much. Uh, I'm Catherine Thomas. I'm a microeconomist at uh, London School of Economics. I wanted to return to your description of the denials at the beginning of your lecture. And um, one thing that you, you didn't mention um, about how the UK is different from uh, other European countries is the high level of um, household debt through because of the mortgage burden. And wasn't there a logic that any given interest rate increase would have a, a quicker and a sharper impact on demand in the UK because of this household debt. And if that logic doesn't hold, was that just, a, is that, am I misremembering what I've read somewhere? Or were there other things that were offsetting that? Uh, um, not misremembering at all. Um, but it's fair to say that I think something has changed in the UK mortgage market, which is that the uh, typical mortgage is no longer a, an overnight rate. Um, you've gone to two-year, three-year, five-year fixes. Um, and so what that does mean is that the monetary policy effectiveness immediately of a change in, in base rates is probably smaller than it once was. And it still works in other channels. It should, in theory, work through the exchange rate. It should work through the impact of short rates and long rates. It should affect um, the willingness of companies to borrow and so on. But if you're looking at the housing market specifically, I would probably argue that the the, the, the speed at which monetary policy operates through the housing market is slower than it once was. Now, you could say that that would suggest you should you know, raise rates slowly for a very long time until it all finally kicks in. Um, or you could say exactly the opposite, that you have to raise rates much more in the short run to have some grip to the economy that otherwise wouldn't be there. Um, my, my own view is that if you compare the UK with other countries, you know, all raising rates at roughly the same time, one of the big differences is that, and to be fair to, to the Federal Reserve under Jerome Powell, it was only three months after his transitory comment that he abandoned the use of the word transitory. It was a very quick change. 
as a recognition in the US that inflation was a problem, and then a clear indication, in my view, from the Federal Reserve that interest rates would be on a, a persistently rising path. Whereas if I were to criticize the Bank of England, I would suggest that even through 2022, they still wanted to say, don't worry, it's temporary, we're going to raise yeah. rates a bit, but every single time the indication seemed to be yeah. they're not going to go up any further. Um, and it wasn't really until this year that Andrew Bailey says, actually, our models haven't worked very well, uh, but there are second round effects that we didn't think would occur. Uh, and then that goes back to the issue of credibility, which is that second round effects don't occur if you're completely credible and everyone understands that the terms of trade shock you've had is purely a terms of trade shock. But unfortunately, you know, there's a big point about inflation. It is highly redistributional. And so to ask people not to accept a pay increase or to forego their pay increase when they've had a big hit to their real incomes, that politically, I think, is, is, is difficult. And anyone who believes it's going to happen is probably politically quite naive. I think we've got room for one last question uh, here, and then we'll retire for some beverage. Uh, thank you, Lionel. Uh, it's John Greenwood. <clears throat> um, the, I want to come back to the uh, Burton-Taylor relationship, which was obviously it's not getting too ang much Anglo-American, Anglo uh, or if you like, he you made the is. analogy between. Well, he was Welsh. Um, she was English. That's true. It was. It was. It was, Anglo, it was Anglo yeah, Welsh. Okay. Anyway, whatever. All right. <laughs> okay, I'll back off. Domestic on problem. Not anyway, but broadly, what what I want you to address is that your warnings at the end about government debt and inflation you know, are uh, understandable. But we've had over the last 30 years a huge increase in government debt in Japan and pretty much deflation throughout, number one. Number two, for the last decade and a half, certainly since 2010 in China, we've had a huge increase in overall debt um, admittedly not necessarily government debt, but overall debt and a large part of that in the quasi-public sector. Uh, and again, the inflation rate has just persistently come down over the last decade. So my question really is, is the Burton-Taylor relationship really, you know, simply, or the monetary fiscal problem really an Anglo-Saxon problem, uh, or an American Anglo-Saxon yeah. type problem, uh, or not? So, first of all, um, there's one big difference now compared with the experience of Japan over the last 30 years. And that big difference is the level of interest rates. Um, so that throughout the period where Japan's debt was rising as a share of GDP, Japanese interest rates, and in fact, global interest rates were remarkably low. Um, so under those circumstances, you can just about make the fiscal numbers add up. You can service the much higher level of debt because your borrowing costs themselves are so low. And to be fair, the Bank of Japan contributed to that by uh, you know, yield curve control and all the other things that have happened over the last few years. What I think is more troubling currently, and, and to be fair, the OBR's numbers and the CBO's numbers reflect this, is that if you're now in a world whereby interest rates are persistently higher than they were, then your fiscal arithmetic suddenly looks a lot less healthy. Um, and you have to have you know, other things being equal, a, a larger primary surplus or a smaller primary deficit, uh, to offset those increases in the debt service costs. Now, Admittedly, um, if we were to return at some point to Japanese-type conditions in the West and you go back to very low inflation and interest rates themselves tumble, then I wouldn't be quite so worried. And they say my argument's therefore circular. But nevertheless, uh, where we are currently is more worrisome than where we might have perceived to have been five years ago. Uh, I'd also note that, uh, again, this huge increase in debt has come through uh, in a relatively short space of time. Um, and I think in terms of the Western political uh, economy currently, there is no thirst whatsoever to try to reverse that process. So you know, as time goes by, I think more and more about the possibility of inflation returning. And the final observation I make, and, and this is one that I've been pondering on, I, I haven't written about it, and I'm not sure I will write about it because I'm not sure it's right, but um, Japan itself finds itself in a very peculiar position because if you continue to assume that Japanese inflation is not going to return and interest rates remain very, very low, then it can probably live with these very high levels of debt. But I, what worries me at the moment is that Japanese inflation has risen a little bit. There's a big debate going on at the Bank of Japan about whether interest rates themselves should rise in response to these higher either domestic or global mm -hmm. inflation pressures. And, and were they to do so, 
does that suddenly mean at some point that the actual fiscal arithmetic is effectively undermined by the change in the monetary stance? And if it is, um, then Japan goes from the greatest example of deflation to possibly the greatest example of future inflation. I'm not sure it's right, but nevertheless, the, the, the evidence from the past is, I would suggest, strongly uh, in favor of the idea that ultimately those connections will matter, even though they matter in the very, very short term. Well, I think we should all thank Stephen for a, a truly brilliant uh, masterclass in inflation and in Hollywood. <laughs> uh, uh, Stephen, I, I, I've learned a huge amount, I'm sure everybody else has in this audience. So I thank you for coming and, and uh, enlightening us. Thank you very much. And thank you, Rula. <laughs>